o'clock. So this is the beginning of the Tuckenboro Planning Board meeting. It is Thursday, July 11th. Uh, before we get started, um, does anyone have any questions about general planning board procedures or how we're going forward tonight or anything along that line? No. Okay. Um, tonight we have uh, two things on the agenda. We have a preliminary non-binding conversation uh, with uh, Nick Castell uh, of LFT Property Holdings LLC, tax map 40-4-1-1. Just in case no one has run into this, preliminary non-binding conversations uh, is basically an opportunity for an applicant to come to a board and ask questions about um, how things might be interpreted or, or you know, site plan questions. They are non-binding on the applicant, they are non-binding on the board. Um, because they are informal, there is, there is not allowed to be any plans, paper, anything like that presented to the board. It is purely a conversation. Um, after that, we have an exciting seminar about municipal wastewater systems with Tyler Phillips, so everyone is invited to stay. It'll be captivating. <laughs> Um, before we get going, uh, can we have approval of the minutes? I did not see anything. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, just also uh, worth noting, uh, there was a number of phone calls that came in today asking if the meeting on the 18th has been canceled. It has not been canceled. We have no idea where that rumor came from, but it is on. Um, with that, um, Mr. Castell, did I pronounce that right? Pardon me? Castell? Castell. Okay. Uh, I don't have a lot to report. Uh, I have uh, the 319 condominium num number one, the commercial unit, on the contract to purchase. Uh, I've spent most of my time dealing with uh, two conflicting attorney opinions about the declaration of condominium. So we're still sifting through that. That's a fairly comprehensive document. And uh, the reason I came here was to just do that and perhaps get some input from you about the property. I do have one question about it, and I have one concern. Uh, I have, I'm under a due diligence period with you know some contingencies in the purchase and sale agreement, a normal drill, and. Uh, one of the things I want to do is uh, uh, file for a variance for the non to restore the non conforming use of the property in a residential zone. The uh, uh, Jack reminded me that uh, uh, if we wanted to reopen that, you know, for a commercial use, that that application's got to be made. I'm uncomfortable about one part of it. I mean, I understand, I understand that. I have to do that in order to, uh, and I would, I'd have to do it just to protect my contract to have the, I want to make sure the use is uh, available and, uh, under the contract. But I'm uncomfortable about one aspect of that. Uh, <clears throat> that is, I, I have, I don't have a plan yet together because I've, I've also been looking for some off-site property to bring other, some other component to this, to the Pier 19 product. Have not been able to do that. So what I'm uncomfortable about is I can, I will go down and I'll make application for the zoning board of adjustment uh, for that. But if it is, but I wanted to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that there may be some other periphery of development. I don't think it's going to be contiguous lands that I'd want to link into that. I, I don't know, I'm, for example, I'm, hypothetically, if I wanted to do some boat storage, boat trailer storage, just plain parking, you know, it's a, it's a fairly intense uh, uh, use of that property down there. Everybody, everybody here probably more familiar with that than I am. And, and if I go forward with the uh, uh, variance application, uh, I don't want to. I don't want to be put in the position where I'm somewhere, and I make that application, and later on I have some other develop something that links some other development that links to this. 
uh, I don't want to be perceived as uh, uh, <clears throat> not having made that made the planning board now. I'd have to go before the planning board at some at some point. Uh, don't I? You know, it'd be highly unusual. In fact, I can think of some some boards that wouldn't want want to accept an application for one part of it without knowing what the master plan is. But the reason I can separate them is because whatever I do, if I can do it, they won't, it won't be part of the condominium, so it would be a separate entity. But it may it may affect that. The, the economy. So I wanted to just tell you that I'm, I'm out there exploring my options as well as doing fact finding and uh, I don't have a, a real plan uh, put together yet but but it, it seems clear that there'd be some other some other property involved to make essentially make the math work and make uh, uh, all, all the uh, condominium uh, folks uh, I think happy. So um, I will, you know, I will be back. I will be making an application to the ZBA. Um, but anything you want to give me for history or input will be welcome. I just said one. I, you mentioned not to pull out any plans. I have a site plan. That's the only site plan for the condominium. Okay, that's recorded at the Registry of Deeds. The only one from back in 1989. The only problem is it, it doesn't have the condominium on it, but that's the only plan. So I don't think uh, anybody, uh, I'm not trying to predate anybody here, but I don't think anybody was around in 1989 on the board here that could reflect on that when, the, when that approval uh, took place. Uh, it's, it, in other words, it's fairly confusing. We've got a condominium site plan with, without the condominium on That's the only that's the only plan of record on uh, on, on title of the registry of deeds. If I remember correctly, and this is going back to early memory, when they condominiumized docks and how they were doing it a lot in the 80s was because it was a little bit foggy about how exactly you would condominiumize something that sat over a state waterway. They yeah. usually linked the dock to something on land. And yeah, you have some have some piece right. of real property. And if I remember right, in the case of Pier 19, and this is foggy, but I think they linked it to mailboxes. And I could be wrong, but I seem to recall something along that lines. Which I only reason I remembered it because I thought it was very interesting that they linked it to a mailbox. But that was many years ago that someone told me that if it helps you. No, I've got. I, I'm, I'm aware of that they actually have uh, uh, mailboxes there, but that's not the unit of denomination that they uh, that they drafted the Declaration of Condominium to use. So uh, it, it's a it, it's, there's a fair amount of work being done on that. Um, uh, I, I, that's one of my that's one of the difficulties. I can't really say what my plans are. At least. Yeah, you know, kind of in a cooperative spirit, tell you what I'd like to do there because I haven't, I don't have, a, I don't have a plan. I, I think you're, I mean, I'll, clearly you're dealing with two different issues. One mm -hmm. is your condominium, yep. I mean, and what that entails, um, and two is the land use portion of it, um, as far as what is the property going to be permitted to be used for, and you know, what if any. Um, site improvements may be needed depending on what the use is going to be. So, I mean, just roughly speaking out loud, in my mind, you know, hypothetically, if you went and got a variance and they said, yes, you can run a retail operation in the existing store, which seems the best use of the property, I and mean, what else would you use the building for? So I'm going to assume that the zoning board would be, you know, sympathetic to that. And you said, I'd like to reopen the store and, you know, as we've done, you know, get everything fired up. The store was there before, the store is there now. It's what, not what, what was that, right? The store? There was a store there since the 60s. There was a store there since the 60s. Yeah, yeah it, I mean, it, it moved around. Yeah, they, they, they built the but yeah. It's sitting on the corner right now, across the street, same building. It was always there. 
if, again, this is just me personally in my mind, um, but if you come and say, all right, we would like to, you know, do run a store, but we're also going to, you know, attempt to run more through this in the form of some other type of escalation of business, then to me, we would have to step back and look at the site plan and see what, you know, what are we going to do to address the parking? What are we going to do to address safety? What are we going to do to address those items? Drainage, you know, septic. septic. We're getting into some pretty heavy lifting. So thank you for explaining it better than I could. Uh, I uh, there's where my uncomfortableness is. I I can go and and I, mean, I think have make a reasonable case, have some ground to stand on in terms of renewing the you know the old use. But clearly, I have an intent to make some kind of mixed use out of the property. So, yes, I expect that to be uh, a, a more kind of global uh, look at this property, look at this site, and somewhat of a site plan review, and if, if not a brand new site plan review. So, uh, uh, I just want to confirm, acknowledge what you're saying, uh, what you're reminding me about. I don't have any more facts to offer, offer tonight, but uh, uh, I, clearly my use it wouldn't be limited to what the former use of the property was. So we're working on it. Yeah. I'd love to see the store open. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I met a lot of people just being over there periodically uh, that uh, you know have been fairly encouraging about that. I'm not sure if the math works to no. just open the store. And, and, and I, of course, it is a, a very busy uh, destination there, uh, especially on a good day in July. I think that's my, you know, I, I've driven by there uh, obviously a million times. And, you know, on a hot Saturday, the, the foot traffic, you know, there and the cars and stuff are. Or busy. I mean, it was concerning enough that in town meeting a couple of years ago, someone was willing to donate, or there was talk of donating um, a pedestrian sign, right. um, you know, pedestrian blinkers and you know, crosswalks and stuff, so stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I think the the concern would be increasing, you know, what you would be running through the property and how that's going to affect safety, sanitation, traffic, etc. Traffic is somewhat intense as, as, as it sits. Yep. Uh, so can I just ask uh, quickly what the plans are with the, with the uh, expanded wharf? Sure. Uh, the town is looking at repairing the wharf, not, not expanding it, but repairing it. Um, and uh, the town was awarded some grant money to do repairs to wharfs. Um, so that's one they're looking at. Um, so they started the permitting process, and actually by chance, Tyler's here tonight, who's working on the permitting. Um, the interesting thing is, is if they, the town was to take the wharf and blast it apart and rebuild it and you know, make a giant mess, it would be a very simple process with an EDS because it would be replacing it in time, otherwise known as a permit by notification. But because the town would like to do something fairly minimal, which is minimal impact, um, which is um, decking over a lot of the pilings that are there and driving new exterior pilings and just making it more usable, um, it would be increasing in width by about six inches. Yeah, six, six, six inches. You're really just refacing the planking. It's the way that the requires a new application. So the state views that as an expansion of the ground. Yeah. So, um, I think that Tyler, if you had a best guess, I, uh, we're we're kind of at an impasse at the moment. We may have to go over the uh, the gentleman that we're dealing with's head and, and ultimately um, get denied and then appeal it because right now the supervisor I'm dealing with uh, doesn't seem to find a way that they can permit an expansion. They would consider it an expansion if it's more than six inches. So between six inches and sixteen inches is what you'd have to do depending on different construction techniques, but ultimately the town would just like to kind of build, put a new face on it rather than um, re reconstructing the whole thing. But because of the style of construction, um, they really, we would have to either completely deconstruct it or do this face approach. And the, the DDS doesn't seem to appreciate that, uh, uh, <laughs> 
that choice. And um, so we're trying to make our case, but we're we haven't made much headway. I think I think we will, but it's right now time wise. I, all right, so there's no expansion of the, of the town docks or the launch, the public launch? No, just repair. I mean, the it will be, I mean, I guess technically there would be an expansion because it would be about six inches wider, but um, basically, I don't know if you've looked at them, they're fairly unusable the way they are, and the idea is to make them more like a traditional dock. Mm -hmm. So four by six posts instead of telephone poles decked over on the outside mm -hmm. and uh, walkways down the sides where the dogs were. Well, there's a lot going on in that neighborhood. And, uh, all right, well, I don't need to take any more of your time. I, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start copying the board with any uh, plans, uh, kind of courtesy copy application to the EBA and, uh, and any other kind of conceptual plans. And you can actually do a site plan before the ZBA where you can do them at the same time. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with doing that. Well, interestingly, the, the, one, of the, one of the takes on the, on the, on the meeting document is that they're exempt of site plan review. Okay, this, it's a long process. I couldn't explain the legality of it. But um, uh, so, uh, so I'm d diving into that. I know that sounds, you know, contrary to, to logic. After uh, I think it would trigger site plan review if if there was a, a change of use of the commercial building. I would believe anything at this point because I think we've seen it all in the past few years. So if 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 you got an attorney who wants to put in a letter, we'll send it off to ours. <laughs> so you know. all right. Okay. Thank you all. No problem. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions before we uh, get going with municipal waste work? All right. I think it, Tyler has a PowerPoint presentation, so it'll probably be easier if all of us go down there. Um, so, as we've talked about, um, you know, we're going to be seeing some things probably in the near future that deal with municipal wastewater. And so we decided that it was a good idea to actually get some education on municipal wastewater. And we invited the Board of Selectmen and the Conservation Commission and then which I think we invited the whole town. But <laughs> looks like it's us. <laughs> so, can't imagine. Yeah. Uh, so, Tyler is, uh, uh, grew up in Tuftamoro. Uh, you can see he has uh, the alphabet after his last name. He was a voice uh, of uh, It's actually a wastewater operator at the plant. They both grow a plant. Oh, were you really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, all right. Glasses, so if this isn't is this sharp enough for you? All right, well, um, again, my name is Tyler Phillips. Uh, I was Mac gave me a call to ask, say, hey, uh, we may be seeing some an application uh, here before us in the future. Uh, it might be helpful to review for um, board members and the public as to what. What what is wastewater? A little bit about it, kind of what goes on at a plant, and um, uh, you know, kind of the need for wastewater, and some of the basics. So I pulled together some presentation about some of the basics, and um, I'll start there. And I can get as complex as you want, but I think uh, a lot of times, I don't know if we've been to presentations before on this, but a lot of times I think there's it's usually presented by folks who just do wastewater and they kind of forget that a lot of people don't, you know, they skip over. They assume a lot of people know some of the um, underlying principles. So I thought it would be helpful to maybe review a couple. So 
Today, or tonight, what I'd like to do is go over kind of what is the history and purpose of a treatment plant, a wastewater pl plant, um, the general approaches that are used to treat wastewater. Uh, I can run through Wolfboro system as an example to kind of go through all the different process steps they have um, and talk about, you know, some typical um, effluent, meaning the, the uh, pollutant constituent levels that come out of a plant. Um, I haven't gone and gotten great detail on Wolfboro's plant because, um, you know, I, I think really this is more of a kind of um, foundational talk to give you guys the basis to ask questions should you need to in the future. Um, and uh, it's not so much a, uh, a review of either Wolf Bros plant or any application or anything like that. I think this is really more of a general fundamentals. So with that, um, start off, you know, I don't know if this is bright enough here. Can you guys see some of these the lights? Yeah, uh, yeah, unless it screws up. Well, yeah, maybe a yeah, it might be even better, yeah. Okay. So, I don't know if anyone can remember. I don't know that I can. Um, but quite a while ago, um, you know, there used to be raw sewage was discharged untreated, whether it was industrial for paper plants, um, or even, you know, some places I work in northern New Hampshire, it was only 10 years ago that they were eliminating straight pipes in the brooks and so forth with raw sewage. And, um, but there are some effects, uh, you know, small communities and small homeowners straight piping into a brook, there's bacteria, of course, but never, it's diluted enough that it never really caused problems. But as you started to get in cities and so forth, the concentration of the pollutants uh, led to either toxic conditions, which would actually directly kill organisms, but also this, people started noting, noting, noticing over time that you're having these kind of more um, general effects that were cumulative and over time, it was leading to algae blooms, which can uh, indirectly kill fish. They don't directly kill fish, but that decomposition of that vegetative material sinking to the bottom of the lake. Organisms chew up that material. In doing so, they use oxygen. They can create dead zones and, and ultimately uh, impact the organisms, or at least cause a decline in the, in the habitat for um, the fish species we like, and it starts to decline. It might go from trout to bass to carp to catfish. I mean, you, you kind of, so you don't see this abrupt change, but um, uh, people notice some of these changes. And so Clean Water Act in 1972, um, there was some work in, in early, uh, in the late 40s, but nonetheless, there, was, there were states, uh, uh, the federal government passed uh, the Clean Water Act developed in the NIPTES program, the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, and uh, that's an EPA program. And most wastewater plants have limits. They're not allowed to discharge water, um, whether it's your industry or a town that collects all the sewage um, from communities and uh, discharge. You most you're not allowed to discharge to a surface water without a permit from EPA. Um, now, New Hampshire is what's called a delegated state, which means that New Hampshire actually manages and, and handles the permitting process for surface water discharges. Um, now, that's important because we're going to contrast. Well, for us, a little unique example. We'll use them later as an example, but um, most communities uh, are regulated by uh, EPA and the state. The state does a little bit of, of their own um, program. Whereas uh, Wolfboro is actually just regulated by uh, New Hampshire. And be that's because they don't have a surface discharge. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So again, early efforts, mainly wastewater was focused early on at just removing trash and sand and debris and all sorts of things that got in waterways because it was actually blocking passage of, of boats, uh, clocking, uh, clogging intake pipes for industry. So it was really focused on physical, uh, physical problems. And, if you're not familiar, there's, you know, in, a, in an urbanized setting, Wolf Grove being one, let's say, or you go to um, Manchester, let's say, you have different systems of collection. The catch basins you see in the street, the graded, um, the grates in the street, that is, that is to handle drainage. And that's separate collection system from the sanitary wastewater system. We're talking here about the sanitary wastewater system. This is when you flush the toilet, use the shower, take a bath, dishwasher, all that water goes into the sanitary wastewater system. It's not 
the, the wastewater system does not collect, or is not intended to collect, surface runoff from streets, buildings, and all that. The two systems are separate. You will see systems that have a little bit of connection to it, but Wolfboro has done a pretty good job, I believe, of separating the two. So again, we're kind of really dealing with that, that wastewater, not um, you know, drainage that you see in the streets where a Coke bottle goes down a grate and ends up uh, at the wastewater plant. That's really not what you're, you're seeing here. So again, it was physical first. They focused on trash and stuff that was blocking the waterways. And then the next, the next uh, item that dawned on was, well, you know, these industrial pollutants, we really got to stop them. We really do want industry, but we don't want our rivers turning blue every time we're making blue tissue paper and pink when we go to pink. And, um, and then the nutrients are another component, just as all of you have probably used manure, and uh, manure has high, uh, or has some concentration of nutrients. And similarly, human waste uh, and the detergents we use, although they're lower in phosphorus levels, but the detergents we use as well as cleaners, some of them contain higher levels of nutrients. And those nutrients all accumulate, um, go into our wastewater system, and they determine that, geez, you know, we don't want this getting out and fertilizing water bodies because we end up with these algae blooms, foul smells, because again, that decomposing material, and using up oxygen. So industrial pollutants and nutrients were the next thing that treatment plants were asked to deal with. First, it was just coarse screens just to collect the trash um, and sand and stuff that you might get in the system. Next was kind of a more of a process that was a little more involved, and, and we'll talk about that. So we talked about here, you know, I, I think there's, there's a, you guys all, uh, obviously the lake is an important part of the economy of this area. Uh, you know, and everything is pretty much centered around the lake. And so when we talk about lake health, um, I think it's, and maybe many of you are, are, are familiar with this, but in Winnipesaukee, um, it's a very clean lake, it's a very large lake, so it's pretty dilute in terms, it's pretty, has very low nutrients, it's what's called oligotrophic. Um, and people would like to keep it that way. It's clear, um, you can see quite deep uh, compared to some other lakes that have algae blooms. We still get algae blooms, every lake gets them, um, but, but uh, Winnipesaukee has um, been spared for the most part with the exception of little bays where a lot of times these bays have uh, stagnant water where that algae isn't mixed and diluted. Um, so it's, it, we're starting, you start to see some algae blooms, but um, those algae blooms are an undesirable effect. And as we talked about the process, these algae blooms are created. And as the algae dies off at some point, doesn't have the nutrients, it sinks to the bottom of a lake the organisms that use it up, uh, again, deplete the oxygen, and it can cause, cause problems. Um, without getting too complicated, there is, uh, there is also another process where that phosphorus and nutrients, as they settle to the bottom, they can be re-released over and over and over again. So um, don't forget, when you are, if you put fertilizer into a lake with large you know, nutrients, largely they stay there. Some will get flushed out, but the real key is to prevent it from getting there from, from the beginning. Phosphorus in fresh waters is usually a limiting nutrient, meaning um, that it, it, we already have enough nitrogen available, we already have enough silica, we already have enough other, other uh, nutrients that are just sitting there waiting, and when you get just enough phosphorus, it, it kind of is a, it, like a key in a lock. All of a sudden, it's, it allows algae blooms to occur. So typical concentrations of phosphorus, labeled here as P, short for phosphorus, um, usually they're expressed in what's called milligrams per liter, a weight per volume of water. So think of it as you know a, a, a pellet of fertilizer in, say, a milk jug of, of, of water. That's not the ratio, but it's, it's a weight within water or, again, a, a liquid volume. Per, but ultimately, it's a part, mil, one milligram per liter means one part per million. One milk jug diluted in a million milk jugs that are in a swimming pool, a uh, million gallons, let's say, in a swimming pool, which again is a, I'm not using a, the best example, but it's, it's a ratio. So one thing that's important is what is a background condition? What is a healthy stream? We do, huge, we do studies on huge parcels of land up north that don't have, really have, have very little impacts 
And we see um, the phosphorus concentrations, that important limiting nutrient, is quite low. It's uh, usually 0 0.015, 0 0.018, sometimes lower than that. Um, and so it's, it, what it's saying is, up there, there, is, there aren't these inputs of phosphorus, we don't really have these big algae blooms. Um, and, and that's true across the nation, these forests and watersheds. So you can kind of consider that as kind of pristine conditions in a stream as being quite low. Um, uh, again, 0 0.015 to 0 0.018. Um, rainfall actually has phosphorus in it. So even if it doesn't collect anything, rain falling from the sky has about 0 0.02 milligrams per meter. Matter of fact, 95% of the samples that were collected in this big study that was done in the 80s showed that the majority of them are under this 0 0.02. But it's important to know that phosphorus can even come from the air. As a matter of fact, in urban settings and rural areas where you have a lot of dust and ag and you're kicking up um, actual fertilizers, you can get it as high as, as 0.5, meaning at almost half a milli milligram per liter. So there's quite a range there in rainfall, but it's just important to know kind of some of this stuff is, is uh, just inherent anyway. We're going to have some. So it's important to kind of limit those excess nutrients if we can. Historically, uh, in the United States, most treatment plants were, were because uh, wastewater has loads of phosphorus in it, um, has a certain amount of phosphorus in it, and they try to remove phosphorus. But historically, treatment plants were, tr were attempting to maintain one discharge less than one milligram per liter, per liter uh, one part per million. Um, sometimes that didn't work, particularly where streams, uh, the, the, these, these, these wastewater plants, after they treat the water, they discharge into a stream, it's treated, it's, bacteria's been removed, but it still had some level of nutrients in it. And what people found was, if, that's, if it's just to a stream that eventually goes out to the ocean, not much happens along the way. It doesn't settle and sit there long enough to create those undesirable effects. Still the same concentration. We still have a high level, this one milligram per liter coming in, but it didn't really cause problems. But where they were starting to see problems was where, where these streams came into lakes. And that water can sit there. And that water then had enough phosphorus in it to start creating um, algae blooms. And so, there are different guidelines. New Hampshire itself does not have a numeric standard. They don't have a hard and fast number, and this is kind of true in New Hampshire's tradition. They want to, they want to instead set a performance standard. They say, well, you can discharge any amount of phosphorus you want as long as it doesn't cause an undesirable effect. And like a lot of this flexibility, that's great, except for sometimes the the relationship between the concentration you can discharge and that which causes an undesirable effect is not easily relatable, either in time or space. Because um, you know you can imagine this fertilizer going into a brook; it creates an algae bloom. The stuff decomposes. The next year, it's resuspended. It may take years for that phosphorus to go through all these cycles and transform and end up in a water body where it has an undesirable effect. So, how would you know? You may not know for a period of time. Uh, what the undesirable effect uh, is. So what's been recommended uh, around the nation and even New Hampshire is, is to set some standards for, um, for, you know, we start to know what's, when the problems start to occur. So they've set standards of guidelines around the nation of about a half, 50 milligrams, or excuse me, 0 0.05 milligrams per liter or 0.1 uh, if it goes into a reservoir. Uh, excuse me, not going in. You can have a little more if you're not going into a reservoir. It's staying in a brook goes out to the, uh, to the ocean. Um, so, notice a lot of numbers there, but does anyone have any questions? To, does anyone have any questions on that? It, it, it's, I'm trying, what I'm trying to establish here is, I think phosphorus is typically uh, the one area where people on lakes have the biggest concerns. As far as bacteria, most of the time that's already dealt with. That's kind of almost a non-issue. It's really more the big issue for a lot of lake communities is phosphorus. So it's important to kind of understand the range. Again, you start off with the cleanest at 0 0.015, that's pristine. Rainfall itself has some. Um, they didn't do the best job early on in the US setting good standards. And now we've kind of come to these standards here, these recommended limits. And even those, people always 
want to turn them down a little bit, but people feel pretty comfortable with these, these numbers here, these 0 0.05 and 0 0.1 milligrams per liter of phosphorus. And that's really what we're trying to remove. All the other stuff, I mean, there are other pollutants, but a lot of those do get removed to the plant. And again, for a lake community, usually it's algae blooms are trying to prevent or nuisance aquatic um, plants, which again, the more phosphorus goes in, the more it's fertilized and you can get um, some, a higher growth weight. It doesn't necessarily cause plants to be there, but those plants that are there can grow faster and uh, reproduce. And so what, yes. about, what about nitrogen? Now, so nitrogen um, is something that was a, is and, and really continues to be a real focus for plants, for, for uh, wastewater plants, um, particularly because there are health concerns with elevated nitrogen concentrations for very young children. Um, when nitrogen gets in groundwater above 10 milligrams per liter, um, they found that um, babies have a tough time metabolizing that if they get it in their drinking water. Um, uh, so, but, but nitrogen is more of a factor in coastal areas. So it, nitrogen itself um, is not the limiting nutrient for algae. So, it, but it's still a, a pollutant, an excess uh, nutrient. Um, but they've really linked a lot of the phosphorus to, again, it, sound, it appears as though um, we have enough nitrogen in there to already cause the algae bloom, we're missing the phosphorus. So you could keep adding nitrogen and nothing's gonna happen until you add that little piece of phosphorus. It's a ratio. So people fertilizing, eliminate phosphorus. Is yeah, that's, that's, that's a, you know, that they've shown, um, I mean, there's, there's studies that show when they eliminated, frankly, the, the detergents the amount of phosphorus, and I'll show in a second, the slide, the amount of phosphorus dropped in half. I mean, it just immediately, immediately dropped. It was a huge boom to lakes and lake health. Um, but, um, and nitrogen, again, is still important. It's important for aquatic species. It's more important right at its source where it goes into, I mean, it has an effect. Unlike phosphorus, it doesn't, phosphorus doesn't kill something as it enters water. Whereas high nitrogen, ammonia, can actually cause detrimental effects on fish at certain pH levels. Right. Um, but it's not... Um, it's detrimental of being no oxygen. Uh, correct, correct. Yeah, yeah. Uh, phosphorus will not cause detriment. Right. Phosphorus itself doesn't have any harmful elements. It's just that it increases productivity in a bad way. And uh, it, 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 it so basically fertilizes things. Yeah. Whereas nitrogen, is, um, it can cause direct effects, but it's not the thing that's usually leading to the algae blooms right. you see in a Tyler, what's New Hampshire using now? Are they using the 0 0.050 or are they still using the weight and Well, again, so there's no, New Hampshire doesn't have a standard. They say, they say you can discharge, they don't, they don't apply standards. They're, they're now making treatment plants monitor for it. So they're kind of setting the stage for adding limits, but thus far it's been a narrative standard saying, if you are discharging to a brook or a river and, you're, and people are complaining, there's big, you know, a, a back eddy in the, in the, in the river it's starting to cause algae blooms or you're getting fish kills or then they will chase you back and put standards on it. They'll determine how much you can add to the, to the river or reservoir or how much you can discharge. Um, but there's st it's still, it's a narrative standard. So there isn't a hard standard like there would be for ammonia, which form a nitrogen or copper or lead. Those, those standards are very hard and fast standard. What is, I mean, do you know what wolf grows after you know, the wastewater treatment, what theirs typically runs? Um, I have a number in here, which I don't know how recent it is, but I have a number in here that I, that I um, got online um, from some of their uh, information. Um, and I'll, I'll, I think they're in the, uh, up at the reservoir, it's like 0.2 to 0.4, I think is what they're getting when it goes up to the storage lagoon. I'll, I'll show that in a sec. And it, it, we're gonna, maybe get hung up but I think this is an important piece here I mean I'm assuming that's kind of what people uh, uh, maybe incorrectly assuming but I think this is really is the focus most people most people focus on phosphorus if you're a lake community as I said bacteria is almost a non-issue I mean they chlorinate the water pretty heavily and then it's the chlorine dissipates over time um, in storage lagoon. so most people don't focus so much on the bacteria that's kind of a thing in the past but that's a that's one of those challenges they've kind of figured out how to how to deal with um, effectively cost effectively um, 
it's really people are focused on the phosphorus. So that's why I put a little, little extra time to that piece. But, um, you know, so we go back to treatment approaches here. I think this is again, important to understand why, what, what causes the removal of phosphorus or pollutants. And, you know, we have the old outhouse, right? And, and what was the, what was the process that's removing the nutrients and all that? Well, there's physical filtering as your waste goes into the hole there, it's in the ground, it's physically filtered by the soil. Uh, the soils itself will adsorb, which is for lack of better analogy, it's almost like a magnet. It'll attach um, some of the phosphorus onto the soils. Um, although in an ever increasing, um, you know, there's only so much binding capacity of those soils, so it keeps going outward. Um, there's some biological action. Um, but very primitive, of course, and uh, you know we probably all have seen. I know our camp we had an outhouse for a long time, and you know when it was full, you you'd move it over. But you know, or you dig, you might be digging right into the water table. You could be putting your waste, you know, into the water table, which you know water table. If you guys aren't familiar, is kind of underlying all land. There is some level of water uh, there, and it's all it is is water filling up those little soil part, the little voids between soil particles. Think of a jar of marbles or BBs, and it's all that. At some point, that water is sitting on a piece of ledge and it's sitting saturating the soil and underlying all of us, all land is some water table. And, uh, you know, oftentimes the question was, was how much treatment we're we really getting for that water, you know, for that waste is going into the, um, into the soil. And the, the bacterial removal was actually organisms, natural organisms in the soil scavenging and out competing and kind of beating up and, uh, the bacteria. Um, and they were just relying on the physical, really it was the physical element of the thickness of soil between here and a lake to have that material removed. Um, usually people knew enough to locate those porta johns or, or outhouses far enough, I guess outhouses, far enough away from, from lakes. The next, next system up is what probably most of you are familiar with, which is a, a septic system. And that's still used by a, 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 you know, many people today, most, most communities have that. Um, you're probably all familiar with the components of it, but uh, um, it's important to kind of review because it, I think, again, this gives people a basis of comparison. Um, so, you know, again, sept the septic tank here, this water comes out of your, of your home, enters the septic tank, and then we'll go leach field system. So the septic tank itself is a process where water is coming in, just trickling in. And this is, again, shower water, dish water, your toilets, um, all this water comes in. Uh, not all of it is, you know, poop water. It's, it's, it's of course, collecting everything from, from your home. And that, that water's trickling in and enters this big tank where it has a chance to slow down and ultimately settle and in the septic tank. So there's this physical settling of the solids, air, all that kind of stuff, metals that might be associated with you know, clean, you're cleaning your silverware with a metal, you know, there's a lot of different components that go into that. That stuff settles out. You also have a flotation component where grease and oil from cooking, um, you wouldn't want that to go out to your leach field system that relies on, on water flowing out and soaking in soil because that would seal up the soil. So the septic tank has a, has a, a, a way of, of trapping that grease inside the tank and these in, and uh, then lastly, there's kind of a biological activity that goes on inside the tank that removes nitrogen um, and bio uh, biochemical oxygen demand, which um, uh, is again, kind of what we're concerned with if it was to get into the lake, that's that, that demand, it's those organisms that are using up oxygen to eat uh, waste or algae or whatever. So um, there's a lot that goes on in the tank, but what continues is one gallon comes in, well, that tank is full. That tank is always full with water. Those pipes, there's a pipe in and a pipe out, and that water level stays right there. And a gallon comes in, and a gallon then is displaced out. That is a constant, so the solids stay in there, and that's why you need to pump a septic tank. Now, over time, you know, that, that does condense, and it, it does kind of degrade a little bit, but over time, you need to pump out your septic system. But a lot of the activity, the primary the, the, the primary means of removal of pollutants, whether it's oils and grease, you don't want, you know, again, straight pipe discharging to a river. You could be seeing cooking oil on the surface and fat, baking fat that congeals and that kind of stuff. Um, so this tank does a lot of that removal activity, that initial removal activity. And then the next thing would be the leach field system, which 
And here is a series of lines that are perforated, have holes in them. The effluent that comes out of the tank with that, that initial treatment then goes out into an array of lines. The water, this effluent water, this kind of primarily treated water, then soaks in the ground. And that has its own set of principles for treatment. The soil itself will remove those fine solids, that, you know, the, the solids that are so small you almost can't see them, it look like cloudy water. Again, the phosphorus is removed primarily, almost in, in, in most cases, phosphorus is removed when it comes in contact with a couple different types of metals. And again, think of it like a, like a magnet. Um, either calcium, which we're low in here, but generally iron and aluminum. Our soils have a lot of iron and aluminum, and they, like a magnet, grab on to phosphorus. So that soil, that natural soil we have, is, has a huge capacity to remove phosphorus. Now over time, all those binding sites, just like a magnet you put in some iron filings, at some point there's no more space, surface area to connect. And you'll even find connection points, you know, the iron, uh, you know, in your magnet connecting to others. So you have a, a pretty good surface area, but at some point it will be tapped out. Um, people don't know that, but you know, septic systems, their ability to remove phosphorus does decline over time. And, um, this will this will come up a little bit in a couple minutes, um, but that is the overall uh, effect of a, of a leach field system: is absorbing the phosphorus. Some of the metals are removed, and then biologically, again, the pathogens are removed, just like in the outhouse scenario. Um, they're either physically filtered out or scavenged by again healthy bacteria that kind of outcompete the pathogens. Um, that disposal in New Hampshire um, leach fields you couldn't you couldn't just you know, you couldn't just put a leach field system in wetlands, let's say. I mean, it's, you're not going to get all those effects, right? You're not going to get all that filtering effects, and frankly, it's going to, your pollutants are just going to enter the water body and, and convey on. So you need to separate, you need to have a certain thickness of soil that underlies that uh, system of lines. Those lines are all, all at a certain level. You need, in New Hampshire, four feet above the water table, or with some of the newer septic systems, you can actually go down to two, two and a half feet, um, because they, these new systems kind of created uh, I guess, a, a super habitat for those beneficial bacteria that kill off the bad bacteria and remove nitrogen and so forth. Um, so you need that thickness of soil, about four feet. Sometimes, again, you can go down a little, a little tighter to two, two and a half. But they're relying, the state is saying, you've done a proper job of treating if you have that thickness of soil. You also have to have some distance from a surface water or a wetland. Um, but 75 feet is the law uh, in New Hampshire uh, for wetlands, um, and it can be up to 125 feet from a lake. Some communities have further setbacks, but there are standards of how, how far you are from the lake. And again, it's all based on that thickness of soil that this effluent, this material has been treated in the septic tank in a primary way, it's relying on that soil to polish and clean the water before it eventually dumps in the lake. I mean, all this water eventually goes somewhere. This, this water coming from everyone's septic system ultimately ends up in the groundwater. There's no way around it. I can guarantee all your water ends up, all that effluent ends up in the groundwater. And then that groundwater, it may take, you know, it may take 10 years for that groundwater to reach a stream, or it could take uh, two weeks, depending on how close you are and how coarse the soils are. But it's that, the state has said, if you have a thickness of soil, we feel that you've done an adequate job of treating it. So again, kind of a basic system, but it, most of you probably have, have a septic system. And so here, and it didn't produce that well, but here's some typical numbers and concentrations of phosphorus. This is total phosphorus, I won't get confusing about the different forms, but. Um, so the average coming out of a, um, out of a home, based on, you know, again, some shower water, some from toilets, whatever, is about six to 12 milligrams per liter coming out of a home. Big variable because it depends on what people use inside there. Um, the septic tank, the, the material in the bottom, 200 milligrams per liter. So again, it concentrates because you think that those solids that go in there, which usually have a lot of the, uh, the phosphorus and frankly nitrogen, as they go in there, they sit, they concentrate, they don't leave the tank. So they, they kind of concentrate in, in, in their uh, uh, overall uh, levels of phosphorus. By the time it, water has passed through the tank and is entering into the leach field system, usually it's about eight milligrams per liter. So you can see how much work, quite a lot of treatment is done in this, and basically a septic tank. 
but you're still a pretty high number. Compare that to what we're talking about in terms of what you really you know, want entering the lake, or you know, not, try not to get to the lake. And then studies have shown, some studies have shown that if you go two feet down below the leach field system, that soil has renovated and removed the phosphorus down to, and again, huge variability, but down to 0 0.01 to 3.8. And I realize that's a huge, broad spectrum, but it can relate to what type of soils you have. If you have soils with, again, high iron content or aluminum, you might be getting treatment right, you know, within inches of that system. How old is the system? How much of those sites have been used up? And then as you get down to four feet, again, where the state says, uh, you know, you need to be above the water table, um, you're at 0 0.02 to 1.8 milligrams per liter. But after that, that's entering the groundwater and eventually is, is making its way out to a, to a water pond. So those are kind of some numbers, again, that, that I think all of us can, probably most of us here, can, you know, I, we have a leach field in my house and, uh, you know, it's not that I think about this all the time, but it, it gives you something to relate those numbers to, those, those phosphorus numbers you want to see in, a, Kyle, in the water. What do the average leach field? How long will the average leach field work properly? You know, um, well, there's, I guess, two answers. So one is hydrologically, so, or hydraulically. So if you don't pump your septic tank very frequently, and that septic tank fills right up, and you have water, and you have solids that fill up, and now they're flowing out the outlet, yeah. they're going to be plugging up those soil, all those pipes and the soil itself. They're plugging up those pore spaces in the soil. So you form a mat. And so the soil below it may have a great ability to remove the phosphorus, but you've kind of ruined it by not pumping. So you're sealing up the system. So you can't for it, the water doesn't want to soak in. And frankly, that's most times when systems fail, it's because the soils have clogged up. And the only reason people know they're in failure is because you are continuing to add water from your house, but it's now coming out of the ground somewhere. And you have a smell and green, you know, really green grass and all that. And it's not, conversely, uh, or, or alternatively, you can have a failing, or you can have a system where the water's still going in, particularly like a sand pit or very sandy areas where you can have the water goes in there great. You know, you can get rid of it all day long. You do a good job maintaining your system, but that sand is so coarse that the water can run right through it pretty rapidly, and the sand itself doesn't have enough habitat, if you will, for, it, it, it can, the, the sites can be used up, the binding sites for phosphorus. So you wouldn't call that failure, but when you say how long does a system last, a system could last 100 years if it's well maintained, or it could last, you know, systems can fail in five years if it's ill maintained. Um, and then again, it depends on what your definition is. Hydraulically, a system that's in failure, you can, again, that really relates to maintenance. No one really knows when a system's apparently working great, but it's sending a lot of phosphorus into the groundwater or, or nitrogen. You don't know because no one's sampling. It's a home water. You know, no one's kind of hassling, hassling those people. Um, but it's very evident when you have breakout on the surface and it smells and, you know, your neighbors complain, you know, you, can, you, know, you don't want to live with it. So there's kind of two, two different, I guess, definitions. The common one, as far as people, a system lasting, is talking about the hydrology, that people over time a mat just it just accumulates it the water could be coming in here looking clean but just the the the, the mere fact of that water sitting there uh having um nutrients in it can form a film that seals up the soil and doesn't allow it to to continue to take um take water um, so it, it's it really can vary i mean many people have systems for 30 40 years So now we're getting into kind of more of uh, some of the treatment plants. Um, so again, a, a leach field system is typically just for your own home. There are systems where if you're in a, maybe a, um, a small community, some systems where you have combined one big, one big leach field system or um, you know, maybe a condo association where there is no, there are no you know, treatment plants. There's no collection system. We're not urban enough to make it financially viable to run a pipe all the way down 109A collecting, you know, a line every <laughs> quarter mile. It just, it's too expensive. So um, people use leach fields um, and septic systems and on lot. 
Contrast that with areas that are often what happens is people have start off in little communities. So this is Ossipi's what this is Ossipi's little plant in uh, it's in Water Village, but you know tree root plants are usually started because people have septic systems. They're so close by. Next thing you know, people are getting sick, and their septic effluents going to someone else as well, and you know things start to occur, and all of a sudden people say, hey. We need, as a community or a village, to get together and build a little treatment plant and collection system. So that's usually how it starts. Um, in this case, um, again, this one here is an Ossipi. That's their plant. It's an Imnoff, Imnoff uh, tank, which is basically just a, a way of settling solids. It's a big tank that settles solids, and it's very primitive. It's just screens that screen out trash, stuff that you don't want to clog the system. They have tanks, and then they um, uh, chlorinate it, and it's discharged. So it's, it's um, not super familiar with OSPI system. They have actually two systems, one for septage, but, but nonetheless, you can have a very basic system that really is just a large septic tank. It's a large septic tank, and that's it. It does that primary step. Now, you can see how much was removed from the, from the example of, of the um, residential systems, the, the uh, leach field systems, but there are really basic systems. The next step up are lagoon systems and lagoons are used actually quite a bit around the nation um, lagoon systems are we'll go into in a second um, and then there's what's called secondary treatment which is biological process wolf rose is like that and it's an additional step beyond this primary mode of treatment and it adds some um, some kind of pumpage and abilities to um, enhance and create some some super bugs but Again, lagoons used all over. Um, some lagoons are lined, meaning they have a rubber membrane underneath them or clay core, and it's contained and water comes in. The same droplet of water comes in, eventually leaves at some point. This is a uh, Lake in New Hampshire. Um, shows right, you know, uh, how close it is to the river. Um, and again, these systems are um, balloon pro the lagoon system. Uh, is has primary you remove sand grit and all that at the beginning you don't want that to fill up your lagoon the next stage is the solids will settle out um, in, in one usually one of the lagoons the other one will be aerated and mixed you're trying to encourage the bugs that are in there you give them food give them air so they can keep eat, eating and getting fat and then they sink to the bottom and well, eventually you can remove that and then it, when it's all done when you removed all the kind of uh, try, the, the constant process is trying to separate the water from the solids. Um, that water, before it's discharged to the river, they add chlorine to it. And that's discharged right to that river right there. Uh, I don't know where they, where they discharge. Um, but again, it's generally the bacteria piece they, they've, they've handled. They figured out how much they need to, to chlorinate. Um, typical values, and again, this, you know, these can vary by region and how, who you have on there. If you have a plant that makes beverages that use phosphoric acid, and you have a lot of those kind of industries, you can have very high, you know, Coca-Cola, both phosphoric acid. It can have very high um, um, uh, influent concentrations of phosphorus, but typically, again, six to eight, that kind of matches up with what was coming out of houses, maybe a, maybe a little bit different, but, uh, and then effluent, meaning what leaves the plant when it's done, when it's being and done being treated, one to five milligrams per liter discharge to river. Now, they, what they try to do too is the discharge rates, the amount they can discharge is related to the river flow. It's a dilution factor. But again, you're, you're typically looking at, at, at one to five at a lagoon system. Um, and then we'll use, so other treatment approaches are secondary treatment. That's kind of considered, once you're done with that primary step, then there are other treatment plants that kind of add some other steps to the process to further uh, enhanced treatment. So we can use Wolfboro as an example. Um, it's the one I'm most familiar with. I, I did work there 20 years ago. Um, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with it as well as other plants. Um, but initially, Wolfboro was like the Imnoff uh, uh, situation in Ossipi. It was a very basic plant. Um, and it used to discharge to, um, to the lake. Um, and again, for whatever reasons, uh, during the clean walk, the, the town got grants, um, as many communities did, to enhance their treatment. So they added some other steps. And I'll go through these real quickly. So 
I'm going to kind of take you through the process of the Wolf Brook plant. This is Filter Bed Road here and Bay Street, Bay Street, out this direction. Um, Abenaki would be way up there, 109A, you know, along you know, a mile or so away. Um, water comes in, so again, you have this collection system, system of pipes. A lot of people in downtown Wolfboro are connected in. So again, all their dishwater, shower water, toilet water, all goes into these pipes, it all flows by gravity to a low point. Um, there's a, you probably wouldn't notice it, but there's a pump station, all flows to a low point down on, um, I think there's one on Laner Street, and there's also one uh, um, they, uh, near the, uh, what they used to call it, but in, near Back Bay. So all goes to a point, and then it's because it can't flow by gravity back to the plant, which is uphill, it's pumped from there up to the plant. And there's some primary screens to keep out plastics and stuff that get into the, into the collection system. And, um, but it really, once it gets on site, it goes into this building you see up here. That building is used for primary settling. It's got a screen. It's got a system that cycles out and removes um, sand and all that kind of stuff so it doesn't damage pumps. But each step in this process has a, a reason behind it. Um, so it's really coarse screening. Think of it just a, you know, real coarse screening. Remove things that would damage. That's the first step. Doesn't remove phosphorus necessarily. That's just again trying to um, get stuff to damage uh, out of the system. The next and probably the most important piece that Wolfboro has in there is, is the, uh, these four tanks you can see here. These are these are tanks. They're about hundred thousand gallons each, I believe. And these are where all the activity happens. This is where the magic happens if you're in the wastewater. It's an area that water comes in there. It's mixed and oxygen's added. And what that does is it creates a good environment for these kind of super bugs in there to do their work and remove and scatter. And basically, they kind of beat up and treat the water. They, they remove a lot of phosphorus. They basically incorporate it in their bodies. They're eating the material, and as they do, it becomes part of their body. As they die, they settle to the bottom, and that's the solids, like when you have your septic tank pumped out. That's the material you're removing. So this whole process you're going to see is about culturing these bugs that, that do a good job, they kind of are natural in the environment, but they do a good job and you want them there. They're the hard workers. And the whole process is constantly trying to separate the water from the solids. Once you get these super bugs doing their work, you set, you're constantly doing the separation. But in those tanks, you get some nitrogen removal, you get some phosphorus removal. Wolfboro has kind of a, has tweaked their system to actually enhance the phosphorus removal by, by um, different techniques of, of changing the amount of air and um, so they've removed quite a bit more phosphorus in their tank in their aeration tanks than most systems do. They, they do a pretty good job at the plant for what, for what they have I guess. Um, you also get some removal of volatiles which it's not a big thing but you know some, some stuff that just off gases. And again the tanks allow for process, process control. You can route water from one tank to the other, bypass this, you can so it really is a uh, kind of a junction point for a lot of the system. But a lot of the activity happens in the tanks. The next are these two dome items, which are clarifiers. And this is where water comes in, the solids settle down, and the clear water flows over. And the solids continually are concentrated and pumped and returned back up to the aeration tanks to seed the new superbugs, the progeny that will, will live. And again, it's this propagation of, of, of bugs that do the good work. Um, also here you remove the oils and greases, you know, restaurant dry layer oil and that kind of stuff that eventually make, you know, should be removed at the restaurant, but it's not always. Um, so that root is removed there with a skimmer. Um, this really though allows, this, it's in these, and there's, there's multiple times, sometimes it cycles through multiple times, but simplifying the process, the solids, the stuff that settles the bottom of the tank, they go up to this place here, the liquids come down here, and so the solids, again, just like your septic tank, they go up, they're concentrated, but unlike your septic tank, what they do is they press it, they, they, at least they used to, they would press it out, press the water out, so it turns out like a brown material, and then they either compost it or landfill that material. Um, they will add um, lime or heat, or compo by composting, heat up, it kills off the bacteria in those solids. 
And then that's kind of the end of that piece of it. The solids are kind of now out of the equation. Um, a lot of the material, phosphorus, is removed there. You know, the solids contain a lot of that phosphorus because, again, it's those bug bodies that are, that are been trapped. The liquid portion is, comes down here, and it goes through this pathway where chlorine is injected into it, and it has enough time in contact with the chlorine that it has time to kill off the bacteria. Now, it wouldn't, if the solids were working in there, that, that chlorine doesn't have a chance to work. So you really kind of, it's important that each process is in its, uh, in its sequence for a reason. And down here, this process is the chlorine, this is the chlorine contact chamber, and that's where it kills off the bacteria. Under a normal treatment plant, then this would discharge to the river. This would just discharge right there, it would be done. Because Wolfboro uh, was part, is part, all the rivers in Wolfboro, brooks all drain into Winnipesaukee. Um, they determined it was, it was a bad idea to keep discharging this right into the lakes at this point. They said we still need, because a long time ago there wasn't such enhanced phosphorus removal and they were getting algae blooms. And it's not just unique to Wolfboro, they just had this, what's called an inner basin where all the communities around Winnipesaukee got together and said, all right, we're gonna, the state built the Franklin treatment plant. And the theory was that, that by the time 25, you know, by the time we got to 1990, mid 90s, all the communities around the lake would be built up such that we'd have a sewer system went all the way around the lake and sent all the water to Franklin, where they didn't, where Franklin can discharge to a river. It's on the downstream side of the lake. And all these lake systems wouldn't, they wouldn't have to rely on an option. Where do you put the water? If you can't, if you don't want to have it enter the lake, where do you put it? Well, because Wolfboro's has a treatment plant, and Tuftoro relies on leach fields. Um, Meredith goes to, gets pumped over to uh, Franklin. Um, where, what does Wolfboro do? Well, what they decided to do is not discharge there, and instead they went through a, a, another step of, of spray irrigation. And I don't know again if you guys are familiar with this, but so here we are again. Here's Filter Bed Road. Here, um, here's the treatment plant. I'll keep that as a consistent item. And there is a pipeline. It actually goes up this road, but nonetheless, this water that comes out of contact chamber. Again, where it's been treated to remove bacteria, it's been treated to remove phosphorus to the extent it can. Then it's pumped up to this lagoon system. And that's um, if any of you Abenak is up right about here. It's a cross-country ski trail system you're probably familiar with, but that's about a 100 million gallon lagoon, 14 acres um, that's up there. And water's pumped up there and it stays, it, it, it doesn't have to stay there, but it's pumped up there through, usually through the winter time, um, because um, the way they, this is really just a storage, it's just kind of keeping, storing the water until they can dispose of it. And how are they gonna dispose of it and not get it in the lake? Well, what they came up with was spray irrigation systems and there are lines that that come out of here and they pump there's actually 13 miles of irrigation lines that flow that are threaded through the woods here and over here and those irrigation lines have sprinkler heads on them and what they what they did was they put these lines through so all that treated water that's up in the lagoon they would store it through all the winter when you can't run an irrigation system and then come spring each time when it doesn't rain, each system would be run and would put on two inches of water across this whole 100 acre area. Well, they would cycle areas, but they put on two inches of water a week and it would be sprinklered out through the woods. And it's, you know, again, it had, it already had most of the nutrients removed, but this was an extra polishing step. Um, so that's one system, that those are two spray irrigation systems there. And then there's three over in, um, three over on that side. And then again, there's Abenaki, just to get you a point of reference. So that's what that's what Wolfboro had for quite a while. And I used to actually work in that system there and I'm pretty familiar with it. And they had a lot of problems with these systems, this portion down here, it tended to be wet. And again, you want that water to be soaking in the ground, not landing on you know, a saturated soil uh, to the point where even if it rains, you weren't allowed to, you had to apply a net, a total of two inches. So if you got two inches of rain that week, you couldn't apply to that. You, you, had to, you, you couldn't apply any water. Hence the need for the storage. Winter time, you can't apply in the winter, it freeze up. Nor would it get the uh, pollutant removal that you need um, for particularly nitrogen, which is a, 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 a biological process. So in the winter time, it kind of shuts down. So 
um, they would store that water, but they started running into problems where, you know, they were often but running up against, you know, it's March and the lagoon is full <laughs> or close to full. It only has so much capacity and uh, you rainy spring and you can't apply water. It was just, you know, it really was not as effective as, as they had hoped. Um, so they, and again, this is where I, you know, I, this is because I'm in the specifics of, of Wolfboro Systems, I'll tell you kind of some of the stuff maybe, this is where you may want to talk to the town or whoever may approach town about some of the history, but I'll give you the general history because uh, I wasn't there when, when this spray irrigation system was kind of determined to need some assistance or another additional area for disposal. But I know, I know enough about what their next steps to at least give you an, an overview of it. And so and I'm sure you guys are familiar with this. So the next system was, all right, we need a backup plan. We need a place to dispose of this way of water. Again, we can't, the Wolfboro system couldn't discharge to a surface water like other systems. They had to force the water in the ground. They had a groundwater discharge current regulated by the state. The water can't flow over the surface. It had to go through the ground because they wanted to get that additional level of treatment and, um, and disposal. So Wolfboro system, again, here's the, here's the treatment plant. Here's the lagoon system. We had our spray systems we just talked about. And then they can they pumped or I think I believe it's actually gravity um, through a siphon system, but it, it goes. They constructed the rapid infiltration basins, which are up here, and I'll zoom in on those in a second. But um, this is the numbers you were asked about, Matt. I think I believe these are the numbers, 0 0.2 to 0 0.4. But that's I I you should it, it, I'm sure it varies. Number one, and I think you probably also. You should confirm those numbers if, if that's of, of, of interest to you guys. But I believe that's what they're currently producing, what comes out of the, you got the plant, comes out of here, then it goes up here, it stays there for a period of time. And when, it, when they sample, I guess when it leaves, um, that's about the number they're looking at, 0 0.2 to 0 0.4. Again, you can compare that to the numbers that we talked about earlier about what you'd like to have in, there's a dilution factor and so forth, but, um, but that's, that's how they're, they're, I think it was built in 2007 or 2008. It's a little more zoomed in version. Again, what's applied to the sand is this, what I believe to be their, their effluent numbers of 0.2 to 0.4. Um, again, the, these, these RIDs, rapid infiltration basins, our, our company has designed a number of these. Um, they work, you know, if they're in good soils, they work pretty well, um, but I understand they had some problems up there, but you're really just putting water onto the sand to dispose of it. Um, you do get additional treatment. How much? Depends on the soils and a lot of different factors. Uh, I don't know what they're getting for removal from when it hits the sand surface to when it enters um, a brook or surface water or the groundwater. I don't know those numbers. Um, but I, I, I think again, by understanding the process, now you can kind of frame you know, uh, your interest or, or, or um, uh, you know, understanding of uh, what, you know, what, what their numbers are and the various treatment steps that, um, that it's gone through, how much removal they got, and frankly, probably how much removal they continue to get from here into the water table and out. Again, comparing it maybe to a leach field. Some, there's some, you know, scale issues, but, you know, scan, it, 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 you can't scale it up and down, but, it, but I would say it's, it is similar. It's a pretty good thickness of soil. Um, so my understanding of the problem with the RIVs was that they found in the design of them, I think they sit, they sit pretty high up on a sandy knoll. So there's quite a lot of sand or soil for that um, effluent to move through. Um, and I believe what happened is that it goes through and then there was a lens of less coarse sand, maybe finer, tighter material, call it clay, probably wasn't clay, but a finer material lens, and that water comes down, hits that, mounds up on it. Rather than continuing down and going down, it hits that and it flows laterally and it's saturated a slope, like this one here, saturated a slope, then that slope couldn't resist the forces, the saturation and the roots, and it slumped. And I think the problem then became that anytime they applied 
um, water up there, a portion of that water then flows over land rather than staying in the soil, but it would flow over land and could reach a brook or a wetland as a surface discharge. And that's not allowed under their permit. They need to have it be a groundwater discharge permit. So I think that's the challenges they're facing now are how can we get this water back in the ground? It's supposed to be in the ground. You get a dip, so it's more of a disposal option, a, 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 a problem. You get some additional treatment, but I don't know that that is the true intent of the R, of these RIDs now that they've done a pretty good job at the treatment plan of removing the phosphorus. But I think that is their current challenge of how can we get, still apply water up there, how can we dispose of the water, put it back in the ground and not have it pop out again. And so I, I, I believe that's likely what they're, the challenge they're facing. I mean, that, that's, you know, that issue's been going on for quite some time. I had a chance to visit the site 10 years ago, maybe, or uh, when, it, when, it, when they first had a problem to see it, and I know um, it was quite a stressful situation. They had a brand new system that was not allowing water to go into the ground. So, um, so that's, I think that's their challenge now. And that's, that's really it for what I have. I can go into more detail if you guys want, but I at least want to kind of explain what I understand is going on, um, you know, a little bit of background of what's going on uh, currently. Um, but you know, to get all the details, you should talk to, you know, where I'll have Dave Ford or, or someone from the plant come in and talk to you about the process steps of the current uh, situation. But uh, do you guys have questions? Is there yeah, Put you to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> or gross you out one the other. Um, what if a town like Wolfboro was to put small systems with their household pumping to um, that system, cleaner water to the plant, and then up in? Mm -hmm. Possibility? You mean, you mean if, if, if they kind of had. Uh, Kind of more like the collection system level, kind of more before it even gets to the plant if they remove it. Um, you could, but you know, I would argue that if you were going to do that, you would do that after the plant because if you think about it, the plant has been optimized for, for it can handle these big fluctuations and flows that we get when people are, you know, we have summer influx of people and not, so it has the capacity, it has systems to remove that primary, you know. We, in one building, uh, they can do all the grit removal, let's say, that would take every, you know, every two or three people, think of your septic tank, everyone has a septic tank to remove, you'd have to, have, you're, you're, you're creating uh, redundant. Very expensive option. Yeah. But what you just mentioned, what's the thought process about doing it after? Well, I think that's, plan. I think that's probably what the RIDs are a leach field system, but it's on surface. It's, it's, it, they can take a little more water. Because like a, a leach field system, it, it goes in, it's in pipes, it's all hidden. If they, if they can't get the system working properly, then they have to treat the water with lesser contaminants to push it back up that way. Um, let me understand the question. Actually, I want to understand the question, I guess. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure I understand. Well, when it leaves the plant, it's yes. still got nutrients in yep. there, yep. if they pre-treat it again on yep. a subsystem, then mm -hmm. move it towards, although I know that yeah, they've got to fix the ball, you know, something that's moving around and hitting the clay, but yeah. at least if it's hitting the clay now, it's a lot less, <coughs> it's more like water than it is any other contaminants in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, one, the funny thing, it, all these things, of course, can be done. It's a matter of, you know, is, is it cost effective? Yeah. But uh, the thing that's, interesting about treatment, and you can probably come up with an analogy or, or example in your life, is that as you get further along, you know, it's easy to remove, um, uh, you know, when you've got, you got trash in the lake or something, you know, or you've got something full, it's really easy to start removing to every scoop net full of trash you're pulling out is, is full, right? Because it's all diluted. But when you are now, you only have a couple pieces of trash, it's a lot harder you know what I'm saying? So that removing that last half a percent or all that, it gets harder and harder to remove that last piece. 
Matter of fact, I think Wolfboro was facing to try to, when, they, when the spray irrigation systems weren't working very well, they were, face, they were looking at upgrading the plant with a very robust process to remove phosphorus down to, because I think originally they were probably putting, I'm going to speculate here, but it might have been as much as four milligrams per liter up to the lagoon originally. I don't know that, but it, that's, that, that would make sense, about, that would be about right. Um, and they found by, re, by just reconfiguring and adding smaller upgrades, they got the process down to a comparable level of phosphorus um, removal as spending all this money uh, on a plant upgrade. So they did quite a bit at the plant. I would say the plant may be kind of at its max in terms of it is working about as well as it probably did, working way better than when I was there. So I think it's working pretty well now. There may be though, and when we talk about all these different polishing steps and what is the process that removes, um, if the process they're using now to remove the phosphorus is a biological one, maybe they've maxed out the biological piece. But is there then a chemical piece? You use a different process step that hasn't been maxed out. In a lot of plants they add alum or iron, aluminum or iron, just like with the soils. Yeah. And they add it to the plant, it helps settle out the stuff and you remove it in the sludge. Um, and they can get a little better removal of that. But um, I, I, so they could always add a step onto the process. Um, I don't know, I don't know what they're getting for removal now between the, between the RIV, the, the rapid infiltration basins, and when it goes down, you know, what they're, what they're finding for sample results. Um, if they're finding that it's, back to the levels that are recommended, or if they want to be firm and go to the state standard, it's not causing an algae bloom. Um, I think they'd say, well, we've, we've done enough. You know, we've done enough, why do more? Um, but I think that samples would bear that out. I think as you sample, you know, you sample the brook, and you sample upstream, and you sample down, and you sample the groundwater, and I think they're, they're required to sample you know, the groundwater discharge permit. So, if you started to see increasing levels, you have a you know groundwater monitoring well that has you know a certain milligrams per liter, but this one's still low, further down gradient. And you start to see increasing levels, I would say, hey, the purpose of those wells is to act like a sentinel, early warning system. Oh, our phosphorus is continuing to increase, and then you would have a time to implement another round. I don't know what their numbers are now, though. I, I really don't. But um, I mean, all those things I think are doable. The question is. What is the, uh, if I'm running a plant, I'd say, all right, where am I going to get the biggest bang for the buck? And I grab that lowest hanging fruit. I think they have the plant. Um, probably, probably better to use the RIDs and the spray irrigation system. You know, it sounds like the, the RIDs, when they're working and they're not hydrologically constrained, they're, they actually can take the water up. It sounds like that is a good disposal option. Uh, I understand the town. Tuffin Road doesn't like it because it's close, you know, close, closer to them. Um, but I think, you know, uh, trying to max out what you have is a good, you know, it's kind of your, your way to get the most value. But I think you really do need to look at the, the sample results should speak for themselves, really. Um, so what they're, what they're putting out of the Wolfboro plant, like that, right? we were sitting out there. Oh yeah. Well, as a matter, the Franklin plant, the one that's supposed to collect it all, they discharge. I think they're discharged uh, like a milligram per liter. Yeah, they discharge quite a bit. Like Waterville Valley is considered kind of the best plant in the in the state. It discharges very low to the point where they actually put it in the river and about 10 feet away they suck it out and use it for snowmaking. It's not directly, but it's about as close as you can get. Um, but the, the, you know, around the state, there are varying levels of performance, and Franklin's plant, yeah, is over a milligram per liter to the river. But again, you have dilution. You have, you know, so you have some some dilution factors. So, you know, you've probably heard the phrase "solution pollution is dilution." Well, um, you know, down in Franklin, they have a pretty, you know, the Wimsocky River, and then pretty soon it goes right into um, the Penny and, and <coughs> makes the Merrimack right there downstream of the plant. So. I like that snowmaking. Hmm. Yeah. Well, a lot of snow in Abenaki just feel summer. 
Oh, that was that's yeah. That's been discussed for a long time. It's it's um. Uh, yeah, we worked on a project that Ragged Mountain actually considered that, but uh, the state was uneasy about them using that um, for for snowmaking um, until it you know they wanted a high level of assurance when they pumping bacteria in the air and snow, snowmaking guns. And it's done all over in Maine. They do quite a bit of it, but they don't do it. They just do it in, in lieu of that reservoir. They just pump, make giant mounds of snow, and they melt all year long so it can the ground. You, you don't get phosphorus removal so much from that though. Um, again, it's, it's phosphorus removal really relies on contact of that, per, of that with soil particles and grabbing the you know, soil particles kind of grabbing onto it. Uh, a little bit of vegetation removal, but um, you know, nitrogen is more of a biological process. Phosphorus uh, is again soils. Um, you can enhance it with air and all that, but it's really that phosphorus needs to contact soils to, to, to be removed. I know this is a thrilling topic, <laughs> but... Oh, here we are. Um, yeah. yeah, are there other questions you guys have? I'm forgetting. I think my brain is full. Yeah, okay, yeah. It's good information. Yes. Yeah, I, again, I, I think it just gives you the, the basics so that if someone brings up terms, you kind of know what they mean. Um, I would. The other thing is, don't be shy about stopping someone and say, "Well, hold on a second. You skipped over. You, there's a lot of acronyms in this that people present, and I don't mean me so much. Of course, you can ask me too. But but if someone presents to you these things, I mean, there's a lot of complicating factors, and I think it's 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 not a, it's not unreasonable to stop and say, well, you used eight acronyms and mixed liquor, suspended solids, and all this different stuff. And what is that? And, uh, you know, ask those questions. If you don't know what the step is, and what's the effect of that? What's the good, what's the positive? What's the, and then from that, you can form a, a, a good basis of understanding and, and a good basis to ask um, and make judgments about, you know, potential problems. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Y'all yeah. hungry? <laughs> 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 yeah. Tyler, what's the life in our ID system? Well, that's a good question. Again, it gets back to that same hydrology, you know, it's hydrologically it will probably seal up before the soils are all used up. But you wouldn't know if the soils are all used up in your ability to remove. But so um, that would show up in the monitoring well then. Well, right, if the soils were sealed, like you think of it like put someone puts latex paint into the system and it just forms a mat over that whole sandy system. Well the next time you go to put the water down. It's not going to go anywhere, right? So it's going to build up, and you can't put more water into it because it's, it's ponded up. So it's that it's that sealing up of the soils because you haven't done a good enough job removing the sealing factors, the, the, the organics. Typically, what communities do with RIDs is they scarify them. So take a light ground pressure vehicle; it doesn't want to compact the soil, like a you know tractor with big garden tires on it. And then they'll scarify it, so they'll kind of break up if there's any kind of crust. They'll break that up, so it's they don't remove it necessarily, but it's broken up so that the, the water, the effluent, influent, the stuff coming in, has a chance to get into the soil and soak it in the same soil and soak down. Um, but then, you know, it's who broke those up? Do they do that and scarify it? Yeah. Well, I know they have in the past. Yeah, yeah. They I mean, it's pretty common. It's let that that pond dry out. Yeah. And go down. And yep. Yep. Yeah. And then once the absorbance of the material, the ground's ability to absorb phosphorus is used up, that would show up in the monitoring. It, well. You're right. You're right. Exactly. And, then, and and you know, it's not. You know, it'd be interesting to see kind of a. Um, I mean, their their system's a little unique, and it's kind of perched up pretty high. You know, the systems we've done are been in really flat areas. So. A matter of fact, they build up a mound to build the walls, but otherwise it's just sitting on a big, coarse, sandy area. And so, 
we don't have the issues of breakout of that hitting that because if it hits a clay layer, we never know. It's just going to move laterally. We never see it because it's underground. Um, and so again, RID systems are, I won't say they're new, but New Hampshire's been using them for maybe 10, 15 years. And they're kind of becoming more in vogue because they can handle more water than a septic system. You know, I mean, if you think about it, you could, you can theoretically put, mound up the water and it will kind of go nowhere but down uh, through the soil. Um, so they can put a little more water than they can with a leach field system. Um, so but really, if you have like a big old abandoned sand pit, that's kind of perfect. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it is, and it is, and it isn't, right? I mean, it, it is, on the one hand, because it can take the water. The thing you don't know... The impervious surface. Well, there, the water table. there's the water table, but what you don't know is what is that sand... Again, it's a balancing act. If you have really coarse... Think of, you know, again, like marble, sand at a microscopic level. If it doesn't have... Um, if it moves through it too quickly, or if, if you know... You ever see when they talk about activated carbon, you can take a sugar cube of carbon and it has enough surface area, if you counted all the spaces, all those contact surfaces could cover a football field. And you look and say, no way. It does because it has so many, like clay. Clay has this ability, has this huge surface area, but water doesn't move through it. But it has so many small little holes in it that it actually has a huge amount of surface area. Clay has great removal but it has low ability for water to pass through. So you're trying to strike a balance. Really coarse sand, you can move water through there like no tomorrow, but is it getting the removal? Maybe not as much. There's not as many, initially it does, but over time, those, there's less binding sites. To, make, to, to add another dimension to that, it depends on what, you know, is the sand, what's the sand from? Is it a bedrock that has iron in it? has aluminum in it because that's really what's doing the work. I mean, if you just took a piece of glass that represents sand, it's not going to remove much because there's nothing on, there's no, there's, no chemi there's no attraction. Before they put the system on this hill, how do they know what they have? Or do they not? I mean, do they do uh, about the sand? Yeah, would yeah. They do a core sample down, drill down, I, check, check the Yeah, thing? I think they do, I'm sure they did for the hydrologic piece for right. making sure how from these cores, you can determine what the rate of water passage is through, yeah. you know, how long it takes for it to go through a thickness of soil. It's called saturated hydraulic conduct. That would be before it reaches the ground, the uh, water table. Yes. Right. Yep. Yep. Okay. But I don't. Have to do but that. I don't know is what. Well, you it's know. on a big hill. They take a rig and they actually do a core sample down. Yep. Two hundred feet. Yep. And, and then they extract it, and each yeah. one they'll, they'll measure. There's different textures. Uh, and, and again, I think that was the, the big issue was that that core sample may have, if it was a thin enough lens of material, that you're you know you're a guy running the drill rig. I don't want to mischaracterize it because it's been a lawsuit, but I guess I'd just say you know if you're, they missed, they must have missed that lens of material that 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 layer. That, that layer. Um, that was restrictive and wouldn't let the water go through, and that's I think what caused the the blowout, is, is my understanding. But um, but Jean, I think what you're asking was, did they test the composition of the soils for its affinity or ability to remove the yeah. phosphorus? And I, I don't know that question. Okay. But but that that would be a you know that would be a legitimate one in terms of understanding its long term capacity. Right. Um, someone may say, hey, listen, we're all going to be dead. You know, it's it's, right. it's a million years, but at least like. You know, to your point, what it, there are these two pieces. Failure can happen hydrologically and its inability to finally remove it. It's called breakthrough. At some point, there's no more binding sites. And you know, again, we can be talking theoretically given the size, and I, I don't know the numbers, but but that would be a you know, that's a that's a logical question. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. It also hauled off hundreds of thousands of gallons of sand from that. Oh, did they? Sorry. Yeah. When they made the site. Yeah. No They should have left it. No kidding. Gave, I'm telling you, they hauled away, gave away, hauled away. Hundreds of thousands of guys. Really? Who did the construction? Why did they do that for? It was cold, man. Any motion to what? You die. Second. All those in favor? Thank you.